I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Uh, so today we're going to take a look at a, honestly, one, a tough parable to, a parable of Jesus, a tough one to interpret. Uh, so that's a fun one. So my wife gave me the idea um, when she mentioned a, a verse of scripture that she had been thinking about over our graduates and it just happened to fall within this parable. So um, before we get there, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been entrusted with something, like entrusted with something incredibly valuable? Maybe someone asked you to hang on to this. Hey, can you hold on to this for me? Hey, don't lose this. Like famous last words, right? Don't lose this. Maybe uh, someone hasn't entrusted you with uh, something valuable, but perhaps, perhaps someone's entrusted you with someone uh, valuable that uh, you're, you're not to misplace. And so I heard a story once about a youth pastor uh, who started off uh, as his first church and a bright young mind, bright young mind, uh, but a bit absent-minded. And so uh, this young uh, youth pastor shows up to church on a Sunday night, um, caught up in the moment with a, a credible lesson to share with his students, who were, of course, eager to hear. And as he walks into the building with this beautiful child, hands the child off to a uh, trustworthy person, um, goes on, teaches the class, comes back, and as everyone's leaving the building, looks around and says, where's, where's my kid? And then started trying to, to, to work backward in his brain, like, okay, I know, came in the building, and I handed it off, but where is the child? And so, frantically, he searches the building, all right? His wife's at home, not feeling well, he's just at church with the child, serving Jesus, Losing a kid in the process. And so after searching the building over, lights are shutting down, everybody's leaving, the moment of truth comes where you've got to make that phone call. Say, hey, hey, did you come pick up Hannah? <laughs> did you come pick up Hannah from church? I'm thinking, surely, you know, maybe she had, you know, she was one, maybe she got sick through a fit, I don't know. And there's this pause on the other end of the line. And the response was, you lost our kid? <laughs> it was in a bit more firm of a tone than that. And so <laughs> what had happened, babe, is, no, I haven't lost the kid. I just don't know where she is at the moment. And so I remember walking in the building, and I handed off to a really trustworthy person, and I just do not recall who that person is, or, or, or I do not know where they're at this moment. And so um, there was a bit of tension. Let me just say, a bit of tension I could feel across the line there. Um, and as that's happening, I turn, and here comes Miss Deborah with Hannah out of her office. And I'm thinking, Miss Deborah, where were you at two minutes ago? This could have been all a secret, right? This, could have, this would have never come out. This would have just been a secret of me and a few students who were frantically helping me search the building. So my question to you is, have you ever been entrusted with something valuable or someone? Because there's a moment when you've been entrusted with that, that there's going to be a moment of accountability. My accountability was, I thought on the phone, but I was further corrected that it was when I walked in the door. And of course, I brought it up to ask your you know, permission to share the story. And Kimberly said, oh, I remember exactly where I was standing when that conversation happened. <laughs> so, That's been seven years ago, you know? I mean, it's just distant past. But there's a moment of accountability that happens when you've been entrusted with something. And so I wanted to open with that illustration, a bit of fun. But it wasn't fun at the moment, I assure you. And I'm starting to sweat just a little bit thinking about the tension of the moment. But as we look into this text, I want you to have that image and that picture, that nervousness. If you're in that boat and you've done that before, you know the pain I'm feeling right now. But if you've not, you can just kind of imagine what that would be like if your husband were to call and say that he lost your kid. All right. So our text today is in Luke chapter 16. So if you're there, go ahead and get ready because we're going to read that. But I want to open up just a bit of background before we move forward. In this, Luke is the author of this text. Uh, Luke is writing to primarily what we think is a Greek audience, so he's a little bit different than Matthew. They tell many of the same stories. Uh, Luke also includes a ton of parables that are not in the other Gospels, uh, which is neat. And so one of them that we're looking at today uh, is the parable of the shrewd manager. That sounds really fun and intriguing, doesn't it? So Luke 
presents Jesus as a kind of the big picture of his writing, as he's retelling the story of Jesus. He, he does it in a way that in the day, if you had lived in Luke's day, you would have recognized that his book, Luke, and also the book of Acts, that they're actually kind of two volumes to one work. He's the same author, and he was writing a historiography of sorts. He was writing a history about a person whose name is Jesus of Nazareth, and then the effects of that person throughout the book of Acts and the message that Jesus brought. And so that's what Luke was writing in, and he's presenting Jesus as the Savior and as Lord, whose life, death, and resurrection make salvation possible to all people everywhere. That's the overriding theme throughout the book of Luke. It's a great book. I love because he focuses on a lot on women. He focuses a lot on the down and out, the poor, and, and the, the destitute and things like that. Luke is a great read, so spend time reading Luke. Let's look at our passage, verses 1 to 13. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. That wasting right there, if you look back, Let's see, a couple of chapters here. Uh, No, I'm sorry, just a chapter before. The parable of the lost son, that same word that's used in the parable of the prodigal son about how the son, the younger son, took the wealth of the father and went off to a far country and wasted the money and the resources in that foreign land. And it was, it's the the idea is that it was wasting it doing terrible things. He squandered it. He, his master had great wealth and he squandered it. And in Luke, I think he purposefully uses that word here right on the tail of that of that uh, story to kind of bring that to mind. And so there was a manager, a rich man, whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. My manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors. We get to hear about a couple of them here. He says, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil. Wow, that's kind of a lot, right? 800 gallons of olive oil. So this is giving us a glimpse at how wealthy this master was, that even just one person owed him 800 gallons of olive oil that was worth a thousand denarii, a thousand denarii, like a lot of money. That's like multiple years' wages, okay? 300 denarii were about a year's wage of like a minimum wage worker of the day. So a lot of oil, a lot of money. He says, 800 gallons of olive oil. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. <laughs> That's sneaky, right? He's not the one writing. He's like, in your handwriting, you write down 400 on that bill, on that contract, right? He asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. Scale back, knock off some of that, right? 800 bushels of wheat is still a whole lot of wheat, right? Again, showing how wealthy the master is, but he's reducing the debt of these who have owed, owed the master. And so verse 8, this is just a, a bizarre way of, of this happening. So you have the parable. He's telling the story. And then the, man, the master, the rich one, the one who's about to fire the guy for being a terrible manager of his resources, he says, the master commended the dishonest manager. It's backward sounding, isn't it? He commanded the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Well, that doesn't really help either. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. This is Jesus giving commentary on the parable itself now. We shift. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will be also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trusted, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's pray as we begin to unpack this. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, for being a gracious God, 
for being one who loves us, one who gives us, uh, you've given us your word to study. Uh, God, you've given it to teach us lessons. Thank you for the life that you lived. Uh, thank you for the investment uh, that you've made in us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for these students today as we pray and we, and we seek to send them out. Uh, we, we look at this passage and we proclaim it over them. God, it's really a message. It's not just for graduates. It's a message for all of us. So I pray that our hearts and our eyes would be open today to hear from you by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, I broke protocol. I forgot to have y'all stand as I read the text. I had that written down, but I forgot to tell you. So I promise I love the word of God and I respect it greatly, just like all of you, okay? So let's take a look at this. So what is this thing about being a manager? See, what we've got to get into is that in the ancient world, uh, managers are something that we're pretty familiar with in our day. But in the ancient world, there were very few rich people. Uh, there were very few really, really rich people like this story. And those really, really rich people, sometimes, you know, they just want to go play golf. You know, no, I'm kidding. They didn't have golf then probably. But they wanted to not necessarily be in the nitty gritty of their daily affairs. And so they would look for someone who was trustworthy to help them manage their great wealth. And so in this story, this rich master has found someone. This person is not a slave. It's a free person we see in the text. And this free person obviously showed some skill, some aptitude for leadership and for management. And so he says, I'm going to entrust my goods, my wealth to you. And his idea was that you're going to manage this as if it were me. Like you're going to handle this wealth as if you were me. You're going to manage it well for my purposes. Okay. If you want to think of another biblical story, if you remember from Genesis chapter 39, the story of Joseph and Potiphar's house. Potiphar is a, is a huge leader. He's a big, big deal in the, in the kingdom of Egypt. He's one of Pharaoh's top officials, and he sees that Joseph has incredible skill, and everything that Joseph is about, the Lord blesses in a great way. And so he recognizes that, and he says, hey, Joseph, you manage my estate and my affairs. And Joseph does that, and God blesses Potiphar like crazy. So that's another biblical example you're probably familiar with, that that's the practice in the ancient world. But there weren't very many people that got to be managers because there weren't very many people that were really rich like that. And so there was no such thing in our day. We think of like kind of middle class, middle management, those kinds of things. In the ancient world, you were either really rich, you were just like average, and you were, you know, like we would call in our day, in, our, in America, lower class, and then there was the destitute, like the people who were begging. So there wasn't really the middle class, and you might say that's kind of what we're like today. You know, we're just barely making it in the middle class. But, you know, I assure you that the folks then, the day laborers, the folks who went out daily and were dependent upon these rich uh, lords and these managers to hire them to work out for the day. That's what they were looking at. And so to be a manager was an incredible privilege. It was an incredible thing. It wasn't just like, oh, I don't like you. I'm going to go be a manager over here. You couldn't just quit and go elsewhere. I mean, it was like a big deal to be where this guy was. So you have that situation that, that we're working from here. And so um, he's there. He shows aptitude, but it's somewhere along the way. He, somewhere along the way, he loses his way. All of a sudden, he doesn't do a very good job. He's, he's now accused. People are noticing that this man who has this incredible privilege is doing a terrible job, and it's obvious to people around him. And so one of the friends of the master comes and says, man, this dude is wasting your money. He's squandering your money. You're going to have to do something about it. And so what does the master do? Oh, no, that's cool. I'll just let him keep doing that. I'm so rich. I'll just let him keep wasting my goods. No, he's like, man, I'm going to hold this person accountable. And so he calls him in. So this is where it gets tricky. So we're going we're gonna to take a look at the, each of the characters in the parable, and then we're going to look at Jesus, all right? So that each of the characters in the parable, we're going to see what it can teach us. So first, we're going to look at the master. The master is the one with the great resources. He's the one who picks out people to help manage his great resources and to manage them in a way that it's inconsistent with his plan and his purposes in the world. So this master, often in these parables, the master is the one that is representative of God. And so in this context, we can see that the manager, we don't hear a whole lot of description of who the manager is or what he's like or his character, but we know that he has great wealth, like our God does, and that he entrusts that wealth to people like our God does. And so we see that. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that the biggest lesson, the number one lesson from this guy, uh, from the master, is that we are accountable to God. Be accountable. So graduates, you need to know that in this world, you will be held accountable.
for what you do with your life. These folks have invested in you. Your parents have invested in you, your teachers, your coaches, uh, your band leaders, your dance team, I mean, all these things. All these people have poured into your life, and they have set you up and put you on a foundation to send you out to serve God, to manage what God has blessed you with in a way that is in keeping with God's plan and purposes for your life. But you see, it's not just them, because you know what? I was talking to uh, one of our folks a minute ago, and they were saying, you know, 60 years ago, well, that narrows the field, right? 60 years ago, I was sitting right there where they were. 60 years ago, and it's crazy because it'll go by quick, and you'll just look back and you'll think, man, how did I get here? God has sent you on a journey. He has a plan for your life. It's a good plan, but you got to walk in it. And just the first step for me uh, as a man of God was to know that I'm accountable to God first and foremost. I'm not accountable just to what my parents think, although that's important. I'm not just accountable to what my church friends and, and mentors think. I'm accountable ultimately to God. And what we believe in our faith is that in Christianity, that there's no barrier between you and God other than your sin. And when you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus, he takes that sin, he removes it so that you can relate to God perfectly. You can relate to, not perfectly, you can uh, relate to God personally. That's what I'm looking for. Personally, that you can relate to him and so you can seek after God. And so as you have questions about where God's leading you, as you have thoughts and plans, all of those grads, I want to encourage you to lift those up to God and just lift them before him with open hand and say, God, this is what I think, but ultimately what you think is most important because you know me better than I know me. But everybody, is that not what God has done with us? And one day, there was one day that you were sitting in their shoes. There was one day that you looked ahead at a bright life. You looked ahead at all this potential and possibility. So the question is, how well at this moment have you managed what God has entrusted to you? Your gifts, your talents, your abilities. Are you using those to serve his kingdom purposes, to glorify him? Or is it more about, about the world's wealth, the world's system? How are you... How are you using what God has entrusted with you? So the first, first thing from the master is we've got to learn that we are accountable. There is a day of reckoning that's coming, and you've got to know that you're going to answer for everything. And that's both a good thing. It's a motivating thing. It's not just a terrible thing. But just know that your master has great wealth. He has great resources, and he's given them to you to help manage because he trusts you. He wants to work with you. It's not like he's given them to you and walked away. He's given you his Holy Spirit to help walk you through this life. Okay? So second, I want you to notice in the character of the, uh, of the dishonest servant, the dishonest uh, manager, the dishonest uh, steward, depending on what your translation says, the second one is that you need to be faithful to God. So in this context, this parable is a foil. It's, a, it's the opposite. It's the kind of thing you don't want to do, right? It doesn't, you don't just read the Bible and say, oh, this guy was a buffoon. I want to be that guy. No, it is Jesus is telling this so that you'll see, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy, don't be that girl who had this incredible opportunity, had this incredible privilege, you know, that they worked for, all right? This management job wasn't just handed. They weren't entitled to this. They demonstrated character and integrity all along the way, and they achieved this incredible, uh, made these incredible achievements, and there they were with the world at their fingertips. And then somewhere along the way, they lost sight of the things that were most important. They lost sight of the priorities of the master. And then the master is going to come and hold you accountable for that. So the tricky part to this text comes is, is what the dude does. I mean, it's like it's, he's so sneaky. Like, this is amazing. So he calls in the people who owe, and he says, hey, why don't you just scratch through that and write this? And the person's probably like, what? Are we for real? I mean, there were cases in the ancient world where a really wealthy person would mark down the debt to, to show generosity and create favor among the people. And so people would then think, I love that guy. Man, that dude is awesome. Man, I owed him so much money. I was freaking out how I was going to repay him. And you know what he did? He cut the debt in half. And they're like, for real? Man, I'm going to go work with that guy. He is awesome, right? And so then they're not only going to praise the master who then is being generous with this, they're also going to praise the manager because the manager's like, you are my man. You got me that deal. This is amazing, right? And so the, the dishonest manager, right, he's thinking, i got to have a place to land after this. And so if I can work with these other people who owed money, they're going to like me because I got them a great deal. Now, my master, he's not going to be too thrilled because he didn't get all that was his, but he'll probably, I'm not, I'm not sure about you, I would much rather have $8 out of 10 than I mean, I'm trying to scale it down to my level of wealth, right? And so I would rather have, you know, $100 rather 
you know, rather than 200. You know what I mean? If someone owes me 200, if I can get 100 out of it, I'm good. You know, I'm pretty grateful for that. And so I know the master was probably thinking, you know, 400 is better. Paying me for that, that's better than nothing. However, he was probably a little bit ticked, but what's he going to do? He's not going to go out and say, hey, give me all the rest of that. That dude's got fired. You know, I mean, it's going to bring shame on his name. And so he's going to just go ahead and, and walk in it. And so it's, that's where the, the, the interesting thing is. And so Jesus, as he's telling this, he's not praising the dishonesty of the manager. He's labeling him. This dude was, he was dishonest early on. But then he went ahead and he collected what, he did what he was supposed to do. He managed the resources well in the end and got something uh, out of, rather than nothing for his manager. And so he is realizing that his accountability is coming and he wants to be faithful. And so the lesson to us is be accountable to God, be faithful to God. Those are the two things we see from those characters. But now let's look at what Jesus says uh, in following that. Jesus applies this even further and he says, People pay more attention to worldly wealth than God's people do pay attention to their spiritual life. That's what he says in verses, uh, verses 8 and 9. And so Jesus says in that moment, students, live with right priorities. Live with right priorities. You can't misplace your priorities and expect that the master is going to be pleased with that because you're going to be, that's not being faithful. And so know your father, know your master, know his priorities and live by those. That's verses 8 and 9. Let me read those to you. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed in eternal dwellings. Second is you need to notice that Jesus says to be faithful with little. Being faithful with little is important. In our culture, we think, I just want to be faithful in the big things, but God's just as concerned that we be faithful in the small things. And so he says here in verses 10 through 12, live with integrity. Live with integrity. Don't just live with right priorities. Live with integrity. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you can't be trustworthy in handing worldly wealth, who's going to entrust you the true riches? And what he's saying there is, is a thing that I see all the time. Nobody wants to start at the bottom. I talk to graduates all the time, and they're like, well, I'm going into this field because I'm going to make six figures when I graduate. And I'm like, psh, psh, no, you're going to actually be scrubbing toilets, you know, for the organization that you want to go work for. Because most managers, most people that are going to hire you in, you're not going to start off at the pinnacle of your career at, at 21. I'm just going to throw that out there for you, okay? You're not going to. You might be lucky. There's a few people that do, but there are very few. Most of the time, you've got to start at the bottom, and you've got to work your way up. Now, your education, that might help you get up a couple of rungs on that ladder. But ultimately, if you're not going to be faithful in the small things, why would a manager or a CEO entrust you with great things, give you that opportunity to manage, you know, multi-million dollar things, to manage the big things, if you can't be faithful in the small things? And so, when you think nobody else is looking, and you're working that dead-end job that you think is dead-end, Know that God's drawing, God's giving you an opportunity to grow your character so that whenever you do move up into that next position, when you're ready, that God promotes you. He promotes the humble. He promotes the faithful and that you're going to be entrusted with more. And so I just want to encourage you uh, with that. Third thing as we move toward our close, pick your master wisely. Verse 13 says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's pretty straightforward in American talk, how I would bring that to our day. You can't serve God and believe wholeheartedly in the American dream. In some ways, we've tried to bring those two together that if you are completely faithful to God, that you're going to land that awesome job, you're going to get that huge house in the suburbs, on the golf course, you're going to drive the sweet cars, of course you're going to be generous with what you have. That's not necessarily the case. That very, very well may be the case. That may be God's plan for you. He may entrust you with that. But you've got to know that no matter how much you have, whether you're entrusted with little or with much, money, worldly wealth, it is, a, it is something that the enemy wants to use to take you away from God to take you away from depending upon him, to allow you to chase after that and to trust into that rather than trust in him. And so just be aware of that. You can't love God with all your heart and love money with all your heart. You just can't. 
And so you just need to know that because I hear a lot of times, oh, I'm just going to get out there. I'm just going to make all this money. Maybe you didn't come from money growing up. Maybe you did. Either way, you need to know that money is a cruel taskmaster. It's something that you'll never get enough of. If you, if you chase after it, if that's what you love and you build your whole life on it, you'll never get enough of it. It's, it's like drinking salt water. It'll only make you thirsty for more. You need to know that you have another option. You don't have to chase after money. You can chase after God. He's a gentle taskmaster. He says, my, my burden is light. He's gentle. He invites you to step into his lifestyle. He invites you to step into his ways, to entrust him. And as you do that and you're faithful, He's going to entrust you with riches that you can't even imagine. He's going to entrust you with the wealth of the kingdom of God, the etern- things that are of eternal value. And so as we conclude, I want everybody to think through this. There's a day coming. There's a day coming where you're going to sit down, you're going to have a conversation with the Father. You're going to sit down, you're going to look the Father in the eye, and you're going to give him an account for how you lived your days. You're going to be accountable to God, and he's going to want to know, were you faithful? Were you faithful? Did you love his son? What did you do with his son? He's not going to worry about your GPA. Amen. Hallelujah, right? He's not going to worry about your GPA and all the honors you got. Those are cool things. Those are great things, but he's not going to be worried about that. His question is going to focus on, what did you do with my son? Did you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Did you seek after him passionately? Did you serve his bride, the church, faithfully? That's what he's going to ask. That's what he's going to ask you, graduates. That's what he's going to ask us, church. So my question to you is, have we been found faithful? Are you faithful in the small things? Are we faithful in the small things? Because the day is coming where we're going to have that conversation with God, and he's going to want to know, what did you do with my son? Did you hear the story of love, grace, and mercy? Did you repent of your rebellion as you trusted in King Jesus by grace through faith? Or did you lose his son. Did you lose the son of God in the midst of a noisy world full of everything that you could want and nothing that you need? The call to all of us today is to be accountable to God, be faithful to God, live with God's priorities, live with integrity, live for God through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God the Father. So as our band comes up, I want to invite all of you to stand with me as we have our time of invitation. One of the beautiful things I love out of this passage is that it's never too late. When you look at the lesson, one of the lessons you can learn about being faithful from uh, from the dishonest manager, I love that he didn't give up, that he didn't walk away, that he went ahead and did things the right way. That it's never too late to follow Jesus as long as you've got breath in your lungs and a thought in your head. It's never too late to follow Jesus. It's never too late to surrender yourself to him. So wherever you're at on this journey, whether you've walked with Jesus for years or whether you've never made that step of faith, you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to invite you to come allow him to be your master. He's a gentle master. He has expectations. He'll expect you uh, to be, he's going to expect you to be accountable and faithful. But you know what? It's an incredible journey walking with Jesus. Amen, church? And so if you've never taken that step of faith, I want to invite you to come talk to us about that. Uh, If you've been on the faith journey and somehow you've lost your way in a noisy world full of everything that you can want, nothing that you need. Turn back to Jesus. Repent, man. It's something you never fall out of. We always want to live a life of repentance, turning toward Jesus, all right? So as we pray, whatever it is that you need to do, if you need to join this church, if you need to come down front and pray, I don't invite you to respond to God as we pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the celebration of our graduates. Thank you for the trustworthiness of your word. And so may it be true in our hearts that we are faithful to you, God, in every single way, in the secret place, in the small things, in the big things, God. Thank you so much for entrusting the gospel to us, entrusting your word to us, entrusting your church to us. And so, Lord, as we send out these students, as we send out your people from this place, may we be found faithful. We pray these things in the power that's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Speak what is true. 